Hey, everyone. Welcome to That's a Good Question, a podcast of Peace Church and a part of Resound Media. You can find more great content for the Christian life and church leaders at resoundmedia.cc. That's a Good Question is a place where we answer questions about the Christian faith in plain language. I'm John. I get to serve as a pastor as well as the weekly host of this show. And you can always submit questions to peacechurch.cc slash questions. Today, I'm here with producer Mitchell, as always. Hey, everyone. As well as Cheyenne and Ashley. Hello. Hi. Great to have you guys here today. Cheyenne and Ashley both lead women's ministry at Peace Church. Uh, Ashley also has training in the area of counseling. And so we get to have a great conversation today about some questions that have come in on the topic of mental health. Producer Mitch, you ready? Yeah. Let's start with a bigger picture question. As Christians, how do we view the human being? Are we only spiritual? Are we only physical? Are we some combination of the two? Are these two parts of us related? Simple answer. They're definitely related. Crazy take. We're only physical. Yeah. There's no spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Just kidding. Yeah, I guess maybe what would be some dangers of viewing us as either or, or maybe emphasizing one aspect more than the other? I think, you know, since we're, our topic today is mental health, um, this question like very much applies, right? Um, is a question that we need to answer. So we need to be careful to make sure that we're addressing mental health as um, something that affects our, our bodies and our minds, but that it also affects our spirits. And um, so our, it's all intertwined. Yeah. I like go, sometimes Christians have made the mistake of just over. So the, the term is over spiritualizing, over spiritualizing everything and forgetting that we also have a body. We are at God made us both body and spirit. Um, and actually for all eternity, we're going to have a body and a spirit put together. We are for a time uh, when we pass away, we our bodies in the ground. Our spirit goes to be with the Lord. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to have a forever body and soul together. Jesus um, had a bodily resurrection. His body and his spirit are, are together for all eternity. We will be, too. So God made us that way. We're going to be that way in the end. And so we got to address issues of this life in both body and spirit. All right, let's jump into the listener question. It's a big one. Is anxiety a sin? You know, I think that's a hard one to answer because there can be a lot of, um, a lot of ways of interpreting the question, a lot of reasons for the question to be asked. And so I think we have to be careful to just jump to say yes or no, right? To, totally. To that question. Totally. It seems like we, we need some maybe definitions. What is anxiety? What is sin? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, John, how do you want to start us off with one of those definitions? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, so sin, I'll take that one. Uh, sin is anything that is a deviation from God's design. Uh, so anything God expressly tells us not to do or or something that is just different from from what God designed for us. That is that is good. That's that's what sin is. It's a. Uh, yeah, a deviation from God's design. Mm -hmm. The Westminster says that sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. How Which, would you paraphrase that? To paraphrase, I would say almost exactly what John said. It's uh, transgressing mm -hmm. against the law. So choosing to do something God said not mm -hmm. to do, and then also failing to live up to what God mm -hmm. has told us to do. So mm -hmm. it's a deliberate crossing of the line and a failure to meet the line mm -hmm. all at the same time. So sometimes intentional rebellion mm -hmm. and sometimes maybe not so intentional rebellion, but just a fail failure to, um, meet the line. I think, what is it to miss the mark? Right. Mm -hmm. Is I think the biblical definition too of, of sin. Um, so then I guess, can, can we move then to defining anxiety a little bit or something? I almost want to add a little bit to what you just, you just kind of started down a very interesting road. Um, and, and we don't have to go too far down this road, but it made me think of, um, kind of just some of the deeper, some, some things that we don't even, aren't even aware of that we're mm -hmm. doing that is sin or just stuff that we're living in that is sin. So I think of like, uh, in Romans 14, the apostle Paul says that every, uh, everything that's not from faith is sin. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you know, there are sort of clear transgressions of the law. The law says, do not murder, you murder, that is sin. Um, but then there's also a lot of things that if you, you do it and it's not from from faith, as Romans 14 says, it's not from uh, the mo good motives, godly motives. It's not good from the right heart or the right place. Um, that can also be you're just you're living in sin because you're not living um, with the, the heart that God has called you to have. Um, and just so that we're clear for everybody. You can't be perfect 
Mm -hmm. Um, that's something we've talked about in other episodes that, uh, until Jesus returns, we, we are people who will live in sin where our our identity is first and foremost in Christ. If you put your faith in Jesus as Lord and savior, then you are in Christ, but you won't be perfect until he returns. And so, um, you know, we shouldn't settle for sin. We should never just give up and just say, Hey, well, you know what? I'm a sinner. I'm just going to sin a bunch until Jesus returns. No, we're fighting against sin and growing every day. Um, and yet also just realizing that the, the goal of life is not to become attain perfection in this life. The goal is to uh, grow, um, but also to, to turn to Jesus every day and realize I'm not perfect, but Jesus is perfect. And he's taken away my sin. Mm, I love that. And so, you know, before we move on even to defining anxiety, remembering too, that there is now no condemnation, you know, to stick with the Romans for those who are in Christ, like you said. So um, I think that's helpful. Uh, my mind can my bef- again before I <laughs> define anxiety, my mind goes to um, I get various versions of this question a lot of is fill in the blank sin is you know is this sin is that sin and I think you know we want as humans so much to be able to control and to keep ourselves from sin and from needing grace hmm. and so I think sometimes hmm. this question is asked because we want to know we're okay hmm. with God. And yet the reality is that we weren't okay with God. We Mm. needed Jesus. And so um, addressing our sin is really, it's it's not a way to see if we can, if we're in God's good favor. It's a way for us to see where we, where we need him as well as all the other areas of our life. Yeah. Yeah. Our motivation is I love Jesus. And so I want to be more like him. I know that it makes him happy. It brings him joy when I'm walking with him. Mm -hmm. So I want to do it for those reasons. But yeah, it, if, if you're operating from a position of trying to earn it or become perfect, then you're, mm-hmm. you're missing it. Mm-hmm. Or feel or feeling like you won't have God's favor until mm. mm-hmm. you overcome this one sin and it's gone and it's never a problem in your life um, mm-hmm. again. So I just wanted to, to, you know, acknowledge that and bring that into it. If um, that question is being asked partly for that, for that reason. Um, so I think that then when we talk about anxiety, there's a lot of ways to think about it, but maybe, a one helpful way to think about it would be just to think about anxiety on the one hand of, of worry where the Bible says, do not worry about your life. Um, but then on the other hand, also there's like, we talked about already that there's a physical side and a spiritual side to us and and they're interconnected and they're intertwined. And so, um, there is a part of anxiety that is physiological as well. And so trying to, um, address both, um, but not be all or all, all focused on one and not thinking about the other as well. So you brought up already the passage, Matthew chapter Mm six says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air that neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And if I skip down a little further, it says, oh, you have little faith there. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the Gentiles seek after all these things. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I think hearing that, and if you're struggling with anxiety, uh, what we'd call clinical anxiety, that might even sound uh, harsh from Jesus. It might sound even unloving. So what's the difference? We were kind of talking about this beforehand, but what's the difference between biblical anxiety and clinical anxiety? For a biblical anxiety is lacking in a faith or a trust in God and worrying about things that we want to control that we can trust God to control. Mm -hmm. The clinical anxiety is when our body's having a reaction that's either warning us of something that's unsafe or that um, is just we've been in an unsafe spot before and something bad has happened. And so our body's now responding to it because that's the response it's learned. And so that's it's very important to know the difference of, of why you're experiencing anxiety, what's going on um, to be able to be define which one it is. That's very helpful. So you're so, I mean, you're saying that. Um... The, the word anxiety in the clinical world covers a, a range of things, but it's sort of an experience. It's a, it's a feeling that hits you um, in certain situations. Yeah. they. Um, so I think that a lot of times people, when they think about anxiety, they think about it as just thoughts in their minds, like bad thoughts, like there's something bad that's going to happen. And that can be the case. And that can be something um, 
that is coming from, I would say, like that kind of biblical anxiety or um, just a fear or a worry that we have, um, where the other side of that is our bodies can literally just respond to anxiety. We can, our palms can start sweating, our heart can mm. start pounding, um, our breathing can change. Like our bodies, even if we're not having the thoughts, our bodies can just respond. It's the opportunity for us to have the signal. It's a signal for us to then say like, okay, what is going on? What is happening? And allowing us to become aware of, are we having thoughts that are um, in the vein of worrying or fearing something? Or is there something that we need to be aware of that's happening outside or a situation that we can either take to the Lord or that just and, and see what he wants us to do with it or just something that we need to be aware of because we need to process something that's happened more than what we already have. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. And some of that um, could be could also be sin, like we said, again, mm-hmm. the overlap between between the two types of anxiety, biblical and the physiological or clinical anxiety, Mm -hmm. I would say, maybe just from my own personal experience, I would say that the physiological clinical anxiety that I have experienced is almost always linked to or um, sending me a signal that I need to sit and spend time with the Lord and Mm -hmm. examine Mm -hmm. where I'm not where I'm not trusting him Mm. and to speak truth to myself, to preach truth to myself, to spend time in the word, to spend time just figuring out what is that fear that is driving me so much to this stress and this, this worry. Um, and what's the truth, what's the truth. And then even especially like who, who is God and what, uh, what am I believing that I can do that maybe I need to be trusting him to do instead of trying to lean on it on my own strength or power. Can I ask a question about that? Absolutely. So when you say that you need to spend time with him doing that, how quickly, when you recognize that you need to do that, how quickly do you feel like you get those answers? Is it within like half an hour, a couple hours, or can it be like days, weeks, or months until you feel like the Lord really reveals those answers to you? Just to kind of give some perspective for our listeners. That's a really good question. I think it has depended on the day and the the thing. You know, at times it's been situational anxiety where I'm about to go into a recording or to go speak on stage. And so the Lord has been so gracious to help correct that even in those moments, like almost, almost immediately. Um, and then there are other things like I'm dealing with some vision loss right now that has... Um, kind of posed a threat to a lot of things in my life. And, um, I would say that has taken me gradually over the last few weeks. The Lord's been helping me with, um, just identifying some of the lies that I've been, um, or fears that I've seen as threats. And there's no, you know, I think of, um, last week in Bible study, we were talking about Job and Job says, um, for nothing can thwart God's plans. And so, um, just clinging to truth is like that, that this is not a surprise to God and that um, I might not have control over this part of my life, but he does. And so I can lean on that, but it takes time. But I don't, I don't think that usually something that so impacts your life is a thing you can just, you know, quick uh, with the flip of a coin, just like turn around and have it figured out and just, um, just tell your body to stop, <laughs> stop worrying. Yeah, <laughs> that, doesn't, right. that doesn't usually work. Um, feel happy, right? Feel happy. Do yeah, not don't worry. worry. Be, be happy. happy. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't usually work like that. No, but I mean, I do think like in those, in some of the situations, like I said, like I get, I get nervous every time I go on stage and Psalm 23, reciting that to myself. I, I think there are things that you can do at times that are a quick, a quicker turnaround. Yeah, I would dare as a clinical person, I would dare say that those would be called coping techniques Ooh. and that going to scripture or listening to hymns and songs yeah, that help our bodies and our minds calm down is a coping technique, which there's mm. other ones that we might get to to talk about yeah. a little bit too, but that's, that's a huge one. Yeah. Sure. And just to be clear, coping mechanisms in that situation, a very good thing, right? Oh, very good things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Cause I, I've heard those talked about as positive and negative before. 
Do you mind saying something about that, Ashley? I've, I've heard people describe coping mechanisms in positive and negative lights, but we're talking about them in a very positive light. So I find that very interesting because I've never heard them talked about a negative light and never thought of them as a negative light. So interesting. Yeah. So I would be curious to hear if you could give some examples as to like how people view them as negative, because that might help me to be able to speak more to the positive versus negative side of that. Yeah, I think not in a clinical sense, but sometimes people talk about things like alcohol or um, some sort of addiction as a, as a coping mechanism or some sort of unhealthy habit that they have in their life as a, a way to cope with something. Is that kind of where you were? That's kind of what, what I thought of. That's Yeah, I was trying to remember back of where I've heard. Yeah, I've, I've often heard people just sort of casually say, yeah, that's why I, I drink or that's why I mm-hmm. you know smoke or yeah. uh, or that's why I yeah. you know do this yeah. thing that's not good. The, I feel like the cult, mom culture, women culture right now is that a glass of wine is how mm. they cope with things. And so, yeah, there you go. So that's, that's, a that's good, like a very, ca- yeah, yeah, I've heard people right. very casually just sort of it's say, oh, that's my coping mechanism. Yeah. You know, it's my, my glass of yeah. wine or yeah. 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 So from a clinical standpoint, if you're a coping technique is a positive thing that you would use in order to help stabilize yourself. A negative, so a negative coping mechanism is something that is unhealthy. So it is, it's alcohol, it's addictions in various forms. It can even be turning a good thing into something that you obsess over. So Mm. I have heard people use exercise at an unhealthy Mm. level as like their coping Mm. technique. Exercise in a healthy proportion is a good coping technique because sure. it it helps process some of the anxiety through your body. It helps just work things through. And so that can be really good, but it, any, everything in moderation. So if you take anything and have it to be um, on an unhealthy amount, it can like become a, a negative. Dependence, like a dependence. A dependence, right. Yeah. Yeah. But like healthy coping techniques are reading scripture and listening to um, hymns and just praise songs. Um, a lot of people talk about like taking a a hot bath or reading or taking a walk or doing something that's a healthy, normal thing in a a normal amount of time that it would take you. You don't want to go for a 10 mile walk necessarily, because that's again, taking it to an extreme. Um, and it could be used as an avoiding technique Mm, (laughs) if you're just out walking for five hours or whatever it's going to be. But, um, yeah, just putting some some healthy things around ways to process through um, what you're feeling and what you're thinking. For listeners out there who might have someone in their life who's dealing with anxiety or depression, what would be some advice that we might give to them uh, in order to walk alongside with someone as a, as a good friend? Uh, what would be some things to avoid? What would be some things that would be like, yeah, I, you got to say this. This is a, a really helpful way to to walk alongside someone. My first thing I would say is don't try to fix it for them. Just try to be present with them. Um, As to what to say, the best thing that we can do is lean on the Holy Spirit to guide because Mm -hmm. each person's going to need something different and in each different circumstance when you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. So allowing yourself to be guided by the Holy Spirit and what he's put on your heart, I think is the best thing and just being present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think just, to reiterate, not, not trying to rush them Mm -hmm. to, um, to change or to be fixed or, or even, um, get like making them think that that's what you want Mm -hmm. for them. But, um, it doesn't mean that we don't still speak truth into their lives. And depending on our relationship, you know, I think we have a little bit more, like we've been, we talked about with the, um, Philemon sermons that we do have a responsibility for, to have a friend, to have some of those friends that we speak hard truths to that we don't necessarily always hold back. But I think that um, sometimes we make it about ourselves. Mm-hmm. And um, like you've said before, like not being comfortable with someone being unhappy. And uh, that's not our that's not our job. That's not our role mm-hmm. as a friend is to try to um, make sure all of our friends are happy. Mm-hmm. which sounds crazy, I think, for women, because I think a lot of times we think that is what we need to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, to just to sit in it. And I think Job's friends are a good example or are a bad example of um, feeling like they needed to just fill 
fill the silence, you know. They did great the first seven days. They did do great the first <laughs> seven days. Yeah. That's true, to give them some credit. They, yeah. yeah, they didn't yeah. totally mess it up, but they they tried to fix it. Yeah, yeah. If I can uh, give a shameless plug here for a lady of mine that I feel like does a, a decent example of this I'll, and a resound podcast. A, I think a lady, um, of yours? a lady of yours. My wife. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I knew where he was going, but you guys got Ashley weirded out. That was awesome. Like, Did he mean yeah. to say that? <laughs> How about this? I'll plug a resound podcast of which my wife is a part of. Um, I feel like mom guilt is a really great podcast that models um, just two friends talking about the guilt that comes with motherhood and how to avoid going into and embracing anxiety um, that I, I can't imagine that surrounds motherhood, but is a good way of uh, mm-hmm. just modeling. Hey, here's friendship walking through this together. Um, not experts on motherhood, but just experts on being friends to one another. I love their podcast. Yeah. They do a That's great a job. Great point too. being in community and sharing what we're feeling anxious about and what we're worrying about with one another can give us, um, support and accountability and a way to process it too, that like, we don't need to just listen. Listening to the podcast would be great, but we don't need to just listen to podcasts. We can also engage in community ourselves. Yeah. I'll I'll speak for them. I think their whole point is that they're modeling something that they hope every woman, every mom Mm -hmm. would have uh, Mm -hmm. a friend who they could go to and talk about um, escaping the guilt of of motherhood and replacing it with the good news of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about this podcast. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe another question would be, what should someone consider when seeking med- uh, medical care or seeking care from a doctor? We'll be right back after this break. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, one of the co-hosts of Mom Guilt, a podcast with new episodes every Monday. Mom Guilt is a podcast about the daily struggles of motherhood. Stephanie and I share real experiences of mom guilt and how we have found freedom from that guilt through the gospel. Listen to us on resoundmedia.cc or wherever you find podcasts. I mean, a couple things that come to mind would be how long they've been, how long they've been feeling this way. Um, If there's mental health issues in their family, I think um, sometimes, you know, we don't we don't want to become so quick to go to medication that um, we're not sitting and considering if you know what a sin what what sinful role might there be and what how could how might community and the tools that God has given us prayer the Bible how might some of those actually really be the only thing that we need? Um, but it's sometimes we do need um, need some medication or need need some help need a counselor to help us process through those things, to be, even be able to sit and to focus on a passage of scripture or to, to pray to the Lord and um, in a way that's like coherent and we feel like our thoughts are somewhat organized. Um, and so I think that, that it is still, it's, it's still good at, if you've evaluated all that to go ahead and yeah, reach out to your doctor and talk to them and bring up, um, bring up those things. And um I don't know. What else would you say, Ashley? I think you've, you've hit on a lot of the big things. I think that, um, for me, I would encourage somebody to seek, talk to their doctor and their doctor is going to guide them through a lot of questions. They're not just going to hand them. If you have a good doctor, they're not just going to hand you anti-anxiety medication just because you say that you've experienced some anxiety. Um, but if your body's having these reactions and these responses, um, when you're not, you're not actually in an an unsafe situation or in, in uh, harm's way that, um, that's a good time to explore being on medication Mm -hmm. so that your brain and your body can be calm enough to process through so that you Mm -hmm. don't use the medication to avoid processing through what's going on in your Mm -hmm. mind and your Mm -hmm. heart, but that it is, um, it's a tool to help you be able to do it, uh, a clear and in a better way. Yeah. And sometimes I think, the doctor might just prescribe something really low dose Mm -hmm. and it might just be even a season of your life that you only need it for a couple months. I, I, um, that's been, and that's been my experience is that I've not had to take it long term, and it's been just helpful. Like you were saying to Mm -hmm. just settle my brain so I could process things and, um, not have to be on it long term. But Mm -hmm. I think the way you said that Ashley was really helpful about Mm -hmm. the 
it's not it's it helps you get to a place where you can process mm -hmm. the issue. Yes. It's not it's not the actual solution itself. It's it's something that that helps you. Or one way I've I've said it as I've talked to people about it is that it's one of the tools in your belt. Um, you know, amongst other things, like we've already talked about talking to Christian friends, praying, reading scripture, being a part of a body of believers, all those kind of things are things that can help. Medication is one thing that can help. It's not, uh, but if you treat it as I have, I have this issue, I have anxiety and the solution is to say this pill will fix me. I would, I would say in almost any situation, not even just anxiety, just life in general, that's not gonna, that's usually not going to work. You need a lot of tools. You need a lot of things involved to to help you through something. Agreed. Yeah. Well, and even, I just think, I don't know, as you're, as you're saying that, I'm just even thinking of how Jesus, when he would heal, um, sometimes he would heal them, but what he said was your sins are forgiven. Mm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so just how he addresses, not just our, you know, physiological needs or our body's needs, but tying back again to that first question we talked about, but our spiritual needs too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, yeah, isn't a fix. And then we don't have to <laughs> sit and, um, do the spiritual, like address our spiritual needs too. We need, we need both. What scripture passages speak to this topic or might someone turn to for encouragement? That's a good one. Well, I think Matthew, the one from Matthew is a good mm -hmm. one. I actually have that on my shirt today. Matthew <laughs> six. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I think, um, you know, cast your cares on the Lord for he cares for you. Psalm 121, Psalm 42, Psalm uh, 23, um, so many of the Psalms, but I could probably go on and on. What do other people want to share? <laughs> There's a passage that I often quote to myself when I'm going through something that I'm afraid of. Uh, it's mm -hmm. Isaiah 41 10. It says, uh, fear not for I'm with you. Be not dismayed for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I just sometimes will recite that in my head. Sometimes before I go up to preach or, mm -hmm. or any, just a, a variety of situations. Mm -hmm. Verses that talk about being strong in the Lord are ones mm. that have helped me with um, anxiety that I've experienced. Um, so I think of Joshua 1, 9, where it says, be strong um, and be courageous. Um, but then the other one that has stuck with me for so many years, and it doesn't talk about being not being anxious, but is Psalm 27, 14. A lot of anxiety comes from fear of not knowing where the what's going to happen mm. in the future. Mm. Right. And so I've often heard it talk about how, um, like shame and guilt is focusing on the past and anxiety is focusing, is focusing on the future. And Psalm mm. 27, 14 says, wait on the Lord, be strong, take heart and mm. wait on the Lord. And that has been one that I am able to tell myself on a regular basis when I feel that anxiety welling up over whatever it might be. Um, I can just, remind myself that I can wait on the Lord to provide, to guide, to direct whatever it is I'm going to need. Mm -hmm. And I can be strong in that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Psalm 77 is one of my favorite passages to go to when I'm having a hard time. Not, not always, I, but I think anxiety is another aspect which it addresses thinking of what you just said, Ashley of. So he opens the Psalm by, by talking about, um, some of his pain he, has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he stopped giving me compassion? But then uh, partway through the Psalm, he pivots and he, uh, he says, I will remember the, the years of the right hand of the most high. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what he's doing is he's trying to remind himself of God's faithfulness in the past to reassure mm -hmm. himself of God's faithfulness in the future. Yes. Amen. And I feel like that's what I need all the time is just, I, I start worrying about mm -hmm. these things that are in the future and I forget completely that, uh, you know, for the years of my life thus far, God has been good. God has been faithful. Mm. We've made it this far, but unfortunately we are creatures of poor memories that we don't <laughs> remember. God's been faithful and mm -hmm. he's with us. I think the Psalms are a beautiful reminder of how we can seek the Lord um, in our anxiety, how we can tell him every bit of how we're feeling anxious mm -hmm. and that he is our wonderful counselor and will guide us through it and mm -hmm. help us process those feelings. Mm -hmm. I agree. I even, um, I think I mentioned Psalm 42 as one of the ones. And what I love about Psalm 42 is, um, the Psalmist says things that we don't think we can say because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he, I mean, essentially accuses God of drowning him. And it's like, Whoa, can we say that? That could mm -hmm. like, but the reality is that God knows our thoughts and, you know, he knows, he knows our anxious thoughts, mm -hmm. it says too. And, um, you know, it gives us words to say and how to come back around and correct it. Um, 
One of my other ones that I was going to read is Isaiah 26, 3. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And that's another one that has, it just like brings me back to have my mind stayed on him. Um, to, to confess those thoughts that I, I don't like, the thoughts that are driving me to anxiety, um, just like the psalmist does in Psalm 42. Um, but then the psalmist also comes back and says, Lord is my salvation. I will again praise him. And so um, to do that too. Mm-hmm. We could probably go on and on, I think, just bouncing back and forth, right? sharing these. Totally. <laughs> well, this has been awesome. I, If I could try to wrap up, and I, I don't think I could summarize too succinctly everything that we just said, but to try to try to bring it back a little bit, the the original question, I think, from the listener was, is anxiety a sin? And I think our answer is a little bit about more practical in the sense that the way that you address that is by yes. Um, I think all of us as human beings face a lack of faith. Matthew 6 seems to draw that out. And so on the one hand, we need to grow in our faith and our trust in the Lord. And we can do that by uh, receiving encouragement from fellow believers, by studying scripture, by prayer. Um, And also we are creatures that have bodies and chemical imbalances and struggles. And so we need to also bring in other professional help sometimes, Mm -hmm. doctors and and things like that. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, hey, everybody, it's been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for your time and for having it. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you have an awesome week. You can find That's a Good Question at resoundmedia.cc or wherever you listen to podcasts.